This movie is actually the way that I learned to make counterfeit currency in training with the US Secret Service. It's a world of counterfeit money, high-speed freeway chases, and Wang Chung. To live and die in LA would have one of William Friedkin's strangest productions ever. And this is from the guy who brought us The Exorcist, a movie with such a fabled production that many still consider it cursed. To live and die in LA was plagued with lawsuits both at and by its director. There too were run-ins with the Treasury Department over counterfeit cash, a cycle of disputes over residuals, and so much more. But that's all just part of what makes it so damn good. Absolute dynamite. And while it proved to be the sort of box office success William Freakin needed, it's the cult status it has nearly 40 years on that keeps it going today. So let's find out what the f happened to this movie. But to get to To Live and Die in LA, we have to glance at William Friedkin's post The Exorcist career. His first outing after was 1977's Sorcerer, a box office bomb that played a key role in the end of the new Hollywood era. Then came The Brinks Job, which showed Friedkin may not have had the most deft hand at crime comedies. After 1980's Cruising, which many considered homophobic and damaging to the LGBT community, although it has since become embraced by the gay community, came Deal of the Century, a dreadful quasi-comedy which you may have never even heard of. In short, Friedkin needed a hit because he had cooled faster than Reagan McNeil's pea soup. For his next film, he wanted to analyze the thin line between good and evil, and also the thin line that exists in each and every one of us. That's what my films are about, he said. That's what To Live and Die in LA is about. To Live and Die in LA came to Friedkin in the form of a manuscript written by Gerald Pedovich, a 15-year veteran Secret Service agent. Friedkin was drawn to the story not just because of the Secret Service aspect, but all of the counterfeiting. The money, the relationships, the personalities. As Friedkin put it, I thought To Live and Die in LA was about a counterfeit world, counterfeit emotions, counterfeit money, the counterfeit superstructure of the Secret Service. Everyone in the film has a counterfeit motive. And so with the manuscript purchased, casting could begin. Playing Secret Service agent Richard Chance, subtle name there, was William Peterson, cast after reading less than one page of the script. Described by Friedkin as a guy who might piss on your mother's grave, but you'd forgive him, Chance gave Peterson just the sort of character he could chew on. Next came counterfeiter Rick Masters, first seen in an incredible opening that shows counterfeiting as an art. <laughs> and why he's seen painting early on. Portrayer Willem Dafoe, who did some of the work on screen, was won over after freaking and casting director Bob Weiner, who also worked on The French Connection, mostly because of his angular face. Rounding out the core cast would be John Pankow as Secret Service Agent John Vukovic, brought in by Peterson himself, Darlan Flugel as Ruth Lanier, John Turturro, and Dean Stockwell. While some of these actors would grow fame as the years went on, in 1985, they were virtual nobodies. Peterson had a bit part in Michael Mann's Thief, also an LA-centric movie with a rad 80s score. Defoe had yet to break out with Platoon. Pankow had small bits in The Hunger in First Blood Part 2, but can be tough to spot. Flugel had small roles in The Eyes of Laura Mars and Once Upon a Time in America. Totoro had yet to be a Spike Lee favorite, and really, only Dean Stockwell had had a career. Hey, he's the boy with the green hair. Even author Petovich got a cameo. Come on, Petovich, get a half a yard. Which was nice of Friedkin, considering there are discrepancies between the two as to who did the bulk of rewrites and scene changes. Considering that, we wonder who takes credit for the boring, recycled, I was days from retirement storyline. The cast was devoted, taking low salaries, as if most even had a chance, 
to keep the budget tight and to have the opportunity to work with William Friedkin. With a budget of $6 million, a sixth of Friedkin's last movie, highlighting his position in Hollywood at the time, To Live and Die in LA commenced production. One of the key hires early on was cinematographer Robbie Mueller, who picked his own non-union crew, which also kept costs down and allowed for a more free shoot. Interestingly, Mueller didn't spell out that the movie is partly set before Christmas, which we only know because of a date at the bottom of the screen. After all, this is not a postcard of Los Angeles. It's far from it. Like his director, Mueller liked to maintain a loose ethic to generate authenticity. Friedkin trusted his actors to collaborate and figure scenes out, sometimes abandoning them entirely during the pre-production phase. As it turns out, Friedkin hates rehearsing, and so would film pre-production rehearsals and sometimes use those shots in the final film. For example, when it came time to the airport chase, Friedkin was concerned the production would get tossed out of the airport airport after Peterson's running on the terminal divider. I said, Billy, that thing is great. It's great. We got to do that. It's great. He goes, yeah, I agree. And so he pretended that it was a mere rehearsal. And if it just so happens that you forget and jump up there anyway. Except he actually filmed it and that's the version we see. And of course they were all down on us. They were screaming and yelling. Billy's like, well, he did it. I didn't, you know, I didn't tell him to do it. I told him not to do it. Why did you do that? Building on Freakin's style and approach to the actors, he told his cinematographer, just shoot them. Try and keep them in frame. If they're not in the frame, they're not in the movie, and that's their problem. Still, one shouldn't be confused here. Both Friedkin and Mueller are still remarkably planned and calculated artists. They just know how to make it appear otherwise. Other people on the set at all times were consultants on counterfeiting, with one even standing in for Defoe at times. Speaking of Defoe, comments he made to the LA Times would result in one pissed off Friedkin. As Defoe told the newspaper, I do get annoyed when you are told to be aggressive or sadistic when the character isn't always required to be. I'd suggest a lighter touch and Billy would say, it's inappropriate. Friedkin would attack the LA Times for even suggesting he has, quote, an aggressive or sadistic attitude about life and seek $15 million in overall damages. This didn't exactly pan out for the director. But things would get even hairier for To Live and Die in LA. For the movie, more than $1 million in fake money was made, with every bill having some sort of error or defect so that it couldn't be used as legal tender. For example, many of the bills only had one side printed, with the other completely blank. Once production wrapped, the plan was to burn every bill so it couldn't end up in circulation. You can probably see where this is going. As it turns out, Prop master Barry Bettig took some of it home, which was later used by his teenage son to buy candy. This didn't exactly make the treasury department happy, and they proceeded to hound the kids and the production itself, forcing Friedkin to show them parts of the film. The crew even claims to have seen multiple helicopters overhead on numerous occasions, believing they were being spied on due to all of the counterfeiting involved. And with that, Principal photography on To Live and Die in LA wrapped. Except there was still one crucial sequence to be shot on State Route 103, the frenetic car chase. The main goal for Freakin was to rival that of the French Connection, which of course has one of the most memorable car chases in cinema history. Freakin even told Robbie Mueller that if he didn't feel it could match the French connection, he would remove it outright from the finished film. Considering it's there, and yes, remains on par with the 1971 crime drama, it's tough to argue with Friedkin. With Robbie Mueller, stunt coordinator Buddy Lee Hooker, such a legend that the Burt Reynolds movie Hooper is inspired by his career, and 40 stuntmen, oh, and William Peterson, who did some of his own driving, the team took more than six weeks to shoot the riveting sequence. One of the tricks they pulled was to have the cars actually going against traffic, with stunt drivers reversing the side they drove on. Something actually inspired by Friedkin himself falling asleep at the wheel and ending up on the wrong side of the road. As Friedkin put it, it was by the grace of God that no one got hurt or killed. The sequence is so disorienting that Pankow's fearful reactions inside the car 
are completely genuine. Friedkin would also later say that Lethal Weapon ripped it off outright. And that wouldn't be the only claim of plagiarism to come. Okay, now production was wrapped. Even if it was a million dollars over budget. But before To Live and Die in LA could be released to the masses, William Friedkin had to figure out the ending, or rather which ending would be used. In the climax we all know, Chance is shot in the face and killed. As you can imagine, MGM execs hated this idea of killing off the main character. In an alternate ending that was shot to appease the studio, Chance and Vukovic get relocated and reassigned. This, however, was only previewed as Friedkin purposely sabotaged MGM's idea. And now, a word from Wang Chung, who did the soundtrack to To Live and Die in LA, thus further tying almost solely to its decade. Friedkin reportedly wanted Miles Davis, you know, because there's a clear trajectory from a jazz pioneer to a band who names a song after themselves. For the music, Friedkin asked that Wang Chung create songs that don't have an end or a beginning. He even directed the music video for the title track, which we have to admit is pretty bodacious. On November 1st, 1985, To Live and Die in LA was released, pulling in $3.5 million and opening at number two behind Death Wish 3. It would go on to grow $17 million domestically nearly tripling its budget, giving William Friedkin the sort of hit that he needed after a series of duds. As for reviews at the time, To Live and Die in LA fared just fine. Although one critic compared the sheer danger in the film to catastrophes associated with the San Andreas Fault. Wait, is that a compliment or not? Some were rumored to be far less ambiguous in their reception, with now debunked claims that Michael Mann even went so far as to sue Freakin for ripping off Miami Vice, for which Mann served as EP. One can also see the obvious links to 1981's Thief, even down to the soundtrack choice, with Mann opting for Tangerine Dream instead. Interestingly, Mann would cast Peterson in Manhunter the year after To Live and Die in LA was released. And that wasn't the last of the lawsuits around the movie. Friedkin's company, SLM, would later be sued by the family of producer Irving Levin over home video rights when that became a force in the industry. Levin's daughter claimed that Friedkin owed her 50% in royalties, amounting to $700,000. It was believed on the other side that since Friedkin already had a lawsuit going against Levin over TV rights, that this was merely a preemptive strike against the director. As it turns out, SLM actually had already given their rights to MGM, thus excusing Friedkin from any lawsuit. Nearly four decades on, To Live and Die in LA has garnered a much-deserved cult following. And it's not just for moviegoers either. An undercover cop once approached actor John Pankow to praise him over how authentic both he and the movie were. As for William Friedkin, sadly, the director passed away in 2023, but he remained his own devotee to To Live and Die in LA. But immediately after, Friedkin's career hit another cold streak. Two years later saw Rampage, a crime drama that Friedkin himself was disappointed with. And to start the 90s, he made the pretty ridiculous supernatural horror The Guardian, which did at least develop a minor following. And the less we say about blue chips, the better. New York when I was younger and I'd be going out to clubs, these real imposing guys would say, whoa, it's Rick Masters, you know. Somehow it worked. That character was like, it made people nervous. 